You could experiment all you wanted, and you could. We, we would look. To, we would insist. We're tired of these, you know, ancient American black and white Western movies. We don't want to look at that. We want to look at something more current, more experimental. And you say, fine. It would not change the rules lined up on the postcards around the wall. If it was going to, if it was a movie that was going to show and then tell, he'd be very interested. He doesn't care what the genre is. Um, the filmmaking craft applies widely, and the, 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 his Watergate exercise proves that it applies even more widely than whatever genres you can come up with in filmmaking. It applies to the, 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 the process of telling information, telling story from one human being to the other. Shooting in a three-camera studio environment is particularly educational because it's uh, live and it requires uh, instantaneous thought about what camera angles to choose and why one chooses them. It's uh, almost like free association. Uh, when you shoot a film and you get into the editing room and you put the outs on a bin and you get to carefully think and have a shivus and smoke a cigar and uh, determine exactly what that cut will be, uh, that's a very exciting way and the normal way to edit, but in live television uh, or in a three-camera studio setup, it requires the filmmaker to be particularly nimble in terms of understanding what their subject matter is, what the script is, uh, what the potential is of each of those frame sizes, how to cue the camera people to adjust frame sizes, thinking like a chess person several steps ahead. And I think as a teaching tool, it's a wonderful way for young filmmakers to understand how powerful the medium is both in terms of shot selection and in terms of editorial. Yeah, I think I will keep it. Well, if you want to keep it, there's nothing we can do. We don't have enough money. You just said that you would, you would adapt the child. The facility that we've got here is a sound stage at the California Institute of the Arts. It's equipped with three videotape cameras and the control room back there where the shots from these three cameras can be switched in real time, switched live, so to speak. This sort of multiple camera coverage used to be the standard procedure for all television production when television was mostly live. But with the invention of new equipment for videotape editing, more and more these days, they're working with what they call ISO cameras. That is, each camera has its own tape deck. So that, in fact, there are three tapes in there, and we can edit those afterwards, as you do in film. But for us, of course, the real advantage of this facility is that it's an absolute marvelous teaching instrument. We can demonstrate here immediately for the students the principles of what we call film grammar, meaning the sizes of shots, the screen sizes, the eye lines, the axis, the camera movement, and so on. And they can edit it as an experiment in the language of the cinema. Sandy always stressed to us that we are bombarded these days by images at all times. We are absolutely bombarded by the moving image the storytelling image. It actually works in this context of nonfiction of news. And he said, if I have any value to you as a teacher, it would be to give you the tools by which you can break down this bombardment so that you understand how you're being manipulated and you won't be manipulated. It was very important to Sandy that his students know everything that the audience knew, even though the audience doesn't know that they know it. When a director puts his film into a, a screening room, whoever the audience is brings their own baggage. They know a language. They, even though they have, couldn't put a name to it, they know film grammar. They know how to read what is placed before them on the screen. And what Sandy wanted for his students was that they would know more about that stuff that the audience sort of subliminally knew but could never put into words. The uh, level that the lenses to my eye uh, has a lot to do with Sandy's teaching in film grammar because this would be a slightly more um, objective view. Now, if, if the lens were up a little higher and coming down, it would be more objective. However, if, the lens, if you wanted to make me really look better, you would lower the lens slightly and come up to me because that's the empathy view. But the Contras, the Nicaraguan freedom fighters, are people, living, breathing young men and women who have had to suffer a desperate struggle for liberty with sporadic and confusing support from the United States of America. I watched Sandy point that out with Colonel North's coverage on television. In the coverage of the investigation, when Colonel North testified, the camera angle was always slightly lower 
coming up on him. Now, I take it that this would represent the largest military force anywhere in Central America. It is, is that not only the largest in Central America, it is the largest of all Central America combined. And I take it it also represents a force larger than that currently stationed by the United States in South Korea. Is that correct? That is correct. The reason I destroyed documents. That and was not the question, I, I want to answer that. That is not the question on but the table. But that's important. The question on the counsel. table is different. Are there any documents or were there in your files that you were thinking about shredding on November the 21st that would have been any more damaging politically than one of these diversion memos reflecting presidential approval. Well, the way That's you, the question. The way you have asked the question, I can tell you absolutely not because I don't think the documents existed on November 21st. The angle was obviously somewhat sympathetic to what he was saying. If we are in the McLuhan age in which the, the, uh, the kids of today, um, before they can spell or read, are exposed to the language of the moving picture image on the box, if that is the is the uh, is the, the the literacy of today, I think what we do at a school like this is that we try, try to teach people what it is that they are reading as they read the images by the analysis of films, and teach them literary of expression in the medium as they use eight millimeter or uh, port back uh, videotape cameras or whatever it is. We teach them to speak back to this language in which they are all being educated. One proof of Sandy's high dedication to dramatic structure and also a, an independent validation of everything he was teaching us came during the Watergate hearings in the early 1970s because these were covered in depth on television to such a degree. And when we returned from our summer holiday, Sandy handed us these big, thick manuscripts with all his storyboards of the hearings that he had drawn live while they were going on because he felt that whoever was directing the televised version of these events was a skilled storyteller and was spontaneously cutting from close-ups to middle shots to over-the-shoulder reaction shots with great skill to create an impression of what we were seeing, to, as it were, guide our, our own insight into what we were looking at. She had perjured herself on the stand, but she had never said it in words. It was in looks and in kind of intention and the, also the reveal on her face, so that perhaps if you were sitting there, you might not have noticed, but by watching it on television, because of close-ups, the director had been able to reveal something of, of her look. And he had a lot of respect for the the TV director who was doing a live cutting. He said it was amazing how their instincts worked in a live setting where they had five cameras or whatever in the hearings and how when somebody got cornered, when a witness would get cornered, you know, by a question, how the camera would zoom in a little, you know, it cut back to the senator waiting, you know, zooming, and then the senator would pull off his glasses and like go for the kill. And, and, and the, the cutting back and forth in that, or, you know, another senator uneasy by, you know, sort of a cutaway. He was just amazed at how that was, that was done on live television and cut so well. He said the TV guys had to do, they had to develop those skills of doing it in real time. In terms of emotional charge, Sandy was very clear that what we were able to do was, well, I, I know there is this quote about the, the, where Sandy writes about uh, the ability of the camera to interpret human emotion, not to state it, but to actually witness it and interpret it. You witness the expression on the face, but how do you tell us what that expression means? You tell us by going in close, pulling out, linking that expression to the thing next to it or to the thing that's been happening, the cutaway, the reaction shot, the action itself, the incident you've been watching. All these are ways in which the camera interprets emotion. And Sandy was very, very strong on that. And again and again, you know, cross out the words, let the camera do the talking. The director has a view of who's lying because he would leave the close-up on Gordon Liddy's secretary while she's talking about whether or not she destroyed certain documents. And the camera would even move closer up on the flutter of her eyes when she would say, no. That was quite alarming for us who thought we were seeing a live event simply unfolding and were spontaneously coming to the same truth. Sandy really looked at the practical reality of, I am a friend of yours, I'm too much of a friend of yours, now I'm just lying.
I was looking at the exchange between Howard Baker, the senator, when he was asking, I've forgotten her name, the secretary of Liddy, um, and she was claiming, probably quite justifiably, that when she had typed out the reports of the, the bugging in the Watergate, she, she had no idea of what it is that uh, she was typing. Hard to believe in some way. The secretaries will tell you it's true. At the same time, secretaries, I think, are naturally curious people. I don't like to know what it is that they're typing. But he said, is this is what you're telling me, Miss uh, So-and-so? And she said, yes. And he looked at her. And she looked back. And he said, all right, well, now what happened in that those gaps were, first, um, the editor, Smart, cut away on, is this what you're telling me? So that, is this what you're telling me? We cut to her, and that was over a close shot of her. And you saw her prepare her answer. Shall I, what shall I say? And then she closed up and said, just yes. And you went back to, to Baker. Baker walked, looked at her and said, I don't believe a word of what you're saying. And he went back to her, and she said, you may not. That's all I'm going to say. And he went back to Baker, who said, cool one going to get anything out of her. Okay, let's go ahead. Now, the silences, the unspoken language in that exchange is the language of television and video and is the language that we know better even than words. And, of course, it is also capable of interpretation because right? that, that is your interpretation of the silences, but someone else may have interpreted the silences in a totally different way. Oh, well, forgive me. Mm. Uh, uh, the interpretation I got from the man whose finger was on the button doing the switching Precisely. because I got what he read into yeah. it. And, and what he, he meant you to read. Indeed, absolutely. And this is the skill that I think students had better learn out of film school. Well, let me ask it this way. Had Mr. Liddy been there, what would you have done with him? I would have given it to him. Because it was Gemstone? Because it was Gemstone, and I would have not have, I would have assumed that he did not want it to go be processed, be processed by the Finance Committee now in you, that form. Did you destroy the Gemstone invoice? Yes, sir, I did. Why? Mr. Magruder asked me to destroy it. Did he tell you why? No. He didn't have to tell me why. Well, then I'd like to know why. <laughs> because it, uh, Mr. Luddy had been discharged from the committee. Uh, it had the word gemstone on it. I was familiar with the word gemstone and the way I had used it. I thought probably a lot of members of the committee were not aware of that. Miss Harmony.